Hey everyone, so recently I produced a video that took a look at the compute power of AMD's Navi architecture across a range of games, across various graphics APIs. And the simple takeaway was this, one teraflop of Navi compute power could deliver anything up to 60% more performance than a teraflop from a GCN 1.0 based GPU. Well, that's a huge topic on its own, so if you're interested, I invite you to check that video out. But I also teased this. So this is Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus running on PS4 at 1440p resolution and stacked up against Radeon RX 580 and the new RX 5700. Same compute power, same frequencies and as close as I could get to the same memory bandwidth as I could muster. Interesting results, right? And that's clock for clock. But what if we went further? What if we built a PC around AMD Zen 2 CPU architecture with Navi graphics? Well, thanks to a collaboration with ASUS Republic of Gamers, that's exactly what we've done. So let's check out this build in a bit more depth. First of all, we know that the next-gen consoles will have Zen 2 CPU cores. Eight of them with 16 threads have now been confirmed for the PlayStation 5 at least, and I expect the Xbox to be the same. So we've chosen a Ryzen 7 3700X here, mounted atop an ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix B450F gaming motherboard. I've stuck to standard cooling here as the best information we have via leaks right now is that the max boost clock for the CPU in PS5 will be 3.2 GHz. That's a down clock, so no need for any extravagant cooling, especially when AMD's Wraith Prism is already pretty awesome. Graphics, well I'm going to be using both the AMD RX 5700 and the 5700 XT, but this here is the XT model. Although I'm somewhat suspicious of the leaked 1.8 GHz or 2 GHz GPU being possible in a console box, well I've been wrong on cooling and clocks before, and anyway ASUS has a Strix 5700 XT that does indeed have a maximum boost clock of 2 GHz. Nice. The package is complete with 16 gigs of 3600 MHz DDR4, an NVMe solid state drive, a 650 watt ASUS power supply, and yes, a Pioneer 4K UHD Blu-ray drive. Everything is mounted within a Cooler Master N300 case, and we're running Windows 10. So can a PC build like this really give us anything like console performance? Can we expect multi-platform games that we're going to be testing here to perform as they would on a Navi-based console? Well, we've tried something similar before when we built a PC with AMD Polaris architecture to give some idea of the power level of the PS4 Pro. The takeaway? Well, out of the box, 1440p gaming looked like the best fit for that GPU at console settings. Smart programming, temporal supersampling, checkerboarding took us further than that, of course. But yeah, quite a lot of 1440p games were out there, including Wolfenstein 2, in fact. Let's go back to the clip I just posted showing relative performance between Navi, Polaris and PS4 Pro all at the same compute level. You'll see that the Pro is in the same ballpark as Polaris. It runs more slowly, most likely because we have an integrated GPU and CPU that have to contend for the same bandwidth. But yeah, we're ballpark. That'll have to do for now. But before we carry on about graphics, I wanna talk about CPU. As we all know, the current generation machines use AMD's Jaguar architecture. It was a poor choice at the time, but understandable because it was really the only viable option available to both Sony and Microsoft. We can get a measure of Jaguar as a PC part because a quad-core configuration was released, codenamed Cabini. I've got one and, <laughs> man, it's awful. Fundamentally, Sony and Microsoft stuck two of these together for uh, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, but suffice to say that the next-gen machines will actually have a modern CPU architecture that delivers a proper generational leap. And this we can most definitely demonstrate. A simple benchmark then, the classic Cinebench R15. Let's kick off with two runs of the quad-core Jaguar running at 1.6 GHz to match PlayStation 4 and 2.3 GHz, the clock speed of Xbox One X. Single thread performance gets just 35 points at the slower clock, 128 across all four cores. 
There's a big leap at 2.3 gigahertz, of course, 49 points and 83 respectively. So let's be generous and say that there's perfect scaling across eight cores, giving us projected scores of 256 and 366. First of all, let me stress just how poor this is. Intel's classic Q6600 quad core launched in 2008 and running at 2.4 GHz stock speeds scores about 245 across all cores. So on PS4, that's the kind of CPU power developers had to work with. Remarkable, right? Especially when we see what this chip has produced. Insane physics like this. But the new machines will have a modern CPU architecture, Zen 2 and we can put the new architecture through the same tests as we've just done with Jaguar. In fact, within the ASUS BIOS, we can actually reduce it to a quad-core processor, just like our Jaguar, for a better like-for-like -like analysis. Unfortunately, I can't underclock the chip low enough to match 1.6 GHz, but 2.3? Yes, we can do that. So check this out. Clock for Clock, Cinebench, delivers 2.25 times improvement in performance, and across four cores, it's 3.4 times better compared to Jaguar. Factor in the mooted 3.2 GHz frequency of Zen 2 in PS5, and we're getting a 4.7 times improvement. Remember, this is just one workload, and a limited one too, one that doesn't tap into the new architectural features of the Zen 2 core. Stacking up our projected octo-core Jaguar results against the 3700X with all cores and threads enabled, and we retain the 4.7 times improvement to performance against our surrogate Xbox One X score, rising to 6.7 against our stand-in PlayStation 4 bench. So yeah, this is why we've seen Phil Spencer talk up the CPU specifically in Scarlet, and how the Scarlet teaser talks about the highest frame rates we've ever seen. Now, of course, Cinebench is just one benchmark, one workload, and a far from perfect one, but the scaling we're seeing here from Jaguar to Zen is pretty amazing, a true generational leap. Okay, so before we move on to graphics, let me clarify what I'm talking about with regards to the AMD Gonzalo processor. It's the chip that's rumored to be at the core of PlayStation 5. I've spoken about it in the past as an eight core Zen 2 based APU with some kind of Navi GPU, a good match for both PS5 and Scarlet. So yeah, CPU clocks are a mooted 3.2 GHz, which I used for the Cinebench test there. GPU apparently 1.8 or even 2 GHz. Now I've been a bit on the fence about Gonzalo in the past in terms of whether it's actually a real thing or not. And I am still a touch suspicious about that GPU clock. But the PS5 dev kit image, now confirmed as genuine, does seem to highlight cooling as a priority in the design. And I can confirm recent rumours that the PS5's codename is Prospero, a character from Shakespeare's The Tempest, just like Gonzalo, actually. At this point, I think we need to accept that Gonzalo is indeed the basis of PS5 silicon. So, a Navi GPU then, and in some leaks, even described as Navi 10 Lite. Well, we know that there are hardware ray tracing features in there that aren't in PC's Navi 10. But I digress, the GPU is the big unknown in the design of the next-gen consoles, but similar to the CPU tests, I want to look at this as more of an architectural head-to-head. -head. AMD's RX 5700 design features 36 compute units, the same as PS4 Pro, while the 5700 XT features 40 compute units, the same as Xbox One X. So we can bench both Navi cards, not just clock for clock with the enhanced machines, but also at Gonzalo's mooted 1.8 GHz clocks. But this does require us to have games, games that run at a fixed resolution, games that have unlocked performance, or other games that aim for 60 frames per second but don't quite hit the target. Two titles spring to mind here. We've already seen Wolfenstein 2 here, where the id Tech 6 engine delivers the PC game running on medium settings. And then we have Hitman 2. Hammering down the settings used for Pro and X wasn't easy, but my friend Alex Battaglia had a good go at it. But then, IO Interactive itself stepped in with the PC equivalent settings for all versions of the game. And yeah, Alex was right, basically. Anyway, crucial information, so let us dig in. The story with Xbox One X is very simple to tell in Hitman 2. The X GPU is actually very decent already, and Hitman essentially runs at a hybrid of PCs high, medium and low settings. 
Replicating those settings here, our Navi-based PC is delivering an 83% uplift in overall performance. A more graphically intense mission throws up a similar result, the overall differential being 82% this time in favour of the Navi-based PC. This second level here is very easy to replicate on both systems with very little in the way of dynamic elements. So yeah, an 82% increase in performance. There it is. Okay, so let's now move on to Wolfenstein The New Colossus and a whistle-stop tour of several tests. A walk through the hub area shows that Xbox One X isn't delivering 60 frames per second here, so the frame rate cap isn't impacting our results, and there's an extra 110% of performance. Next up, this water shader seems to have a big impact on performance when it dominates the viewport like this. The end result, at 4K on like-for-like -like settings, it's a literal two times improvement in performance. A spot of traversal through the Manhattan level next, and again, we can see that we're nowhere near the X's frame rate cap here, so we're good to go on like-for-like -like testing. End result, 47 frames per second, versus 91.7 on the Navi machine, giving us a 95% improvement in performance. The final test sees us repeating that same run, but in reverse. I kind of expected the reverse route to provide a different rendering challenge, and it does to a certain extent. We're back to two times performance scaling. So overall then, two games, two matched ports, Navi PC versus Xbox One X, and basically, Navi is 83% faster in Hitman 2, and effectively a full 100% faster in Wolfenstein 2. So now let's look at the comparison between PlayStation 4 Pro and the RX 5700. Again, running at the mooted Gonzalo clocks of 1.8 GHz. Hitman 2 actually runs at 1440p on the Pro, and the first mission tops out at 60 frames per second, meaning that the frame rate cap influences the result and can't really be used. But the second mission I tested doesn't trouble 60 frames per second at all, meaning that it's ripe for comparison. Lower resolution, lower shadows, and lower anisotropic filtering versus Xbox One X, while we've dropped four compute units here compared to our last Navi setup. Anyway, good stuff here. Hitman 2 on our Navi system here delivers a 126% increase in performance across this test. Next up, Wolfenstein, the new Colossus. Same settings as X, but at 1440p. And just like our other tests, dynamic resolution is disabled. Our first test isn't really viable as we hit the PS4 Pro's 60 frames per second frame rate cap easily enough. So yeah, PS4 Pro has lower resolution, but without dynamic resolution in play, it runs faster generally than the Xbox One X. The water shader test is a little more interesting though, consistently under 60 frames per second with a 193% improvement to performance on our Navi-based system here. Moving on to our Manhattan traversal tests. Navi's 36 CUs in the 5700 operating at the Gonzalo Leaks 1.8 GHz. Well, it delivers a straight three times improvement to frame rate and repeating the same traversal sequence backwards sees that increase to a 3.2x boost. Pretty amazing stuff, right? Of course, with the RX 5700 XT's extra CUs, that perf bump would be even higher. So, PS4 Pro versus RX 5700. Xbox One X versus 5700 XT. Same compute unit count, different architectures, and we have a pretty big frequency spike in both cases there. So, how do we explain the results that we've got? Well, they're not so comparable in the sense that we have two different Navi configurations running at two separate resolutions. But I'd say that a system with three times the raw computational power of the Pro and two times Xbox One X, well, that's a pretty good GPU. I do think it's important to remember that the Pro has memory bandwidth issues inherent in its design, along with a lack of VRAM, which may help to explain why the boost is higher. Funnily enough though, doubling Xbox One X GPU performance would equate to what you might call a 12 teraflop GPU, even though the 5700 XT here is only peaking about 9.2. Again, teraflops doesn't really mean that much these days. I think it's more about frequency. I mean, a 1.8 gigahertz GPU in a console would be pretty insane, and I really hope that's true. 
Before I go though, one more test which I was quite excited about, but which proved to be ultimately meaningless. IO Interactive told me exactly how to configure the PC version of Hitman 2 to run at the same spec as the standard PS4. And well, I couldn't resist. As you would expect, the booster performance is pretty high to the point where you hit CPU limits. So I swapped in the 5700 to a machine running an i7-8700K at 5 GHz to really push that GPU. We still get some stutters here, suggesting that we're encountering bottlenecks, but the end result? Only a 3.5 times improvement to performance. Yeah, I think the only takeaway from this test is that 1080p really isn't worth the bother for next-gen gaming. It's going to leave a lot of GPU power on the table. But the reason I carried out this test, you see, the enhanced consoles have changed how we view a generational leap, whether it's two times Xbox One X or three times PS4 Pro. Some people may be disappointed that the GPU isn't a ton more powerful. Got two things to say about that. First of all, the enhanced machines have only really been tested scaling up projects designed for far less powerful consoles. They've not really been targeted in their own right. If two times Xbox One X power, and I should stress that is a guess basically based on what we're seeing from these benchmarks. Well, if that becomes the baseline for games development next gen, I think that's pretty amazing actually, especially if CPU power is at a minimum seven times more capable than PS4. And I also expect to see the GPU doing very different things based around the surrounding architecture. Yes, a faster CPU opens the door to a ton of different opportunities, but then there's the SSD too, perhaps the single most important innovation in the new machines. A small taster here from Alex's recent Star Citizen video, but yeah, running a game built for SSD on a mechanical drive, it just ends badly. Now consider a game built for hardware with low level access to solid state storage. A different animal altogether, and I can't wait to see what this means beyond faster loading times. Anyway, I hope you found this one interesting. Thanks to everyone who helped me to put it together. To ASUS for Public of Gamers for building this machine to my specifications. To IO Interactive for giving us the data to be able to effectively benchmark their game and to other people who I can't name who did help out behind the scenes in putting this video together. And yes, a shout out to the EGX audience at the show who watched a version of this presentation live. But that's all from me for now. Please do like and subscribe to support work like this. Ring the bell for instant, yes, instant notifications whenever a new DF video arrives on the channel. And of course, if you really like what we do, consider the DF Patreon. A small contribution gets you pristine quality video downloads of everything we do and helps out the team immensely in making crazy projects like this possible. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.